A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajeem Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim I begin in the name of the Almighty God, the Compassionate, the Merciful, the one who has created everything in utmost perfection. And may the peace and blessings of the Almighty God be upon his pure and beloved messenger, the peak of his creation, the symbol of humanity, the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and his immaculate progeny of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, especially the leader of our time, the awaited savior, Al-Imam Al-Mahdi, Ajjalallahu Ta'ala Farajah. May Allah hasten his reappearance and make us all amongst his sincere and dedicated servants. Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. I ask the merciful God to accept our deeds and a'mal as we are approaching the end of the month of Ramadan. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us our sins if he has not already done so. For the month of Ramadan is the month of forgiveness. One of the very important discussions today in our financial business lives is digital currency, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, other types of cryptocurrency. Many people in our communities are wondering, is it halal to invest in such type of digital currency? What have our scholars said about that? What is the default Islamic law on that? Is it advised? that we invest in this type of cryptocurrency or is it best to keep away from it is it gambling is it not gambling these are some very important questions that many people have in our discussion this evening we will examine the status of cryptocurrency first we'll examine what exactly it is briefly number two we'll examine cryptocurrency from an Islamic fiqhi legal jurisprudential perspective and then we'll examine some of the dangers associated with such types of investments. Now the most famous type of digital currency or cryptocurrency is the Bitcoin. Now Bitcoin was invented in the year 2008 and the following year in 2009 it was implemented by an anonymous individual. Now, digital currency has certain features. Number one, it's decentralized. It's not controlled by banks, governments, or any particular country. Number two, it's open source. So for instance, the code for Bitcoin is available to the general public. You know, people who know how to read the code, they can actually see how it's coded. Number three, it's peer-to-peer. That means one person can send and receive Bitcoin or other types of digital currency without going through an intermediary, like a central server. Uh, in normal transactions, you would need a central server as an intermediary, but not through digital currency. Number four, what distinguishes digital currency from normal currency is that you can actually keep your digital money on a device like your phone, your computer, hard drive. And yes, if you lose that hard drive, you do lose your money. I read in the news a few months ago that this one particular person lost his hard drive or access to the hard drive and he lost close to $200 million. Now, digital currency like Bitcoin has been compared to digital gold because like gold, it's very scarce. It's a scarce asset. Not all types, but Bitcoin specifically. You know, they say that only 21 million get Bitcoins were ever produced or will be ever mined. And it will end, you know, in the next century, maybe 2140. Now, Bitcoin started with a very, very, very low price. Now, recently, it has exceeded $50,000.
And so many people are rushing to invest in digital currency. It's very enticing. So what is the religious ruling over here? Our scholars, maraja, mujtahids, have three opinions or three fatwas about digital currency. One fatwa, which is popular amongst many, many scholars and researchers, is that it's permissible, it's halal, it's like investing in the stock market. The second fatwa or opinion, it maintains that we are suspicious of digital currency, but we don't have a ruling. So we're not going to tell you it's halal or haram. We're just going to abstain from issuing a fatwa. That's the second group of scholars. The third group of scholars, they've cautioned their followers from engaging in any sort of investment with digital currency. Why? What's their reasoning? Number one, they say, we don't exactly know how it works. It's not clear to us. And we need better clarity to be able to issue a fatwa. Because in order for a marja to issue a ruling, a marja has to know the subject, right? Needs to be aware what exactly they're issuing a fatwa on. And so for some of the maraja, it's not really clear how Bitcoin, digital currency, cryptocurrency works. And therefore, they have abstained from issuing a fatwa until they better understand it or it becomes clearer to people how exactly it functions. Because there are a lot of uncertainties and unknowns about it. Number two, they say that there's no official account or like an official person who's responsible for this. If there's an issue with your money, you go to your bank, right? But if there's an issue with the digital currency, who do you go to? There is no official account or person, and this makes it suspicious. Number three, they argue that this could be misused easily. It could be used for crime illegal activity, money laundering, this leads to financial corruption. So we as believers should not invest in it because it leads to financial corruption. These are the three main opinions of our scholars when it comes to cryptocurrency. Now we mentioned that the first group says it's permissible. By default Islamic law, why would it be permissible? I personally, based on my understanding of fiqh and the fatwa of scholars, anticipate that within the next few years, probably most maraja will clearly issue a fatwa stating that it is permissible. And here's why. Number one, people do treat it as currency. It has market value. Anything that has market value, Islamically, you can invest in. Yeah, unless it's something haram like alcohol, which Islam has prohibited. But anything that has market value, you can actually invest in it. Historically, just to give you an example, scholars, for instance, would say that buying or selling blood was haram. You couldn't buy or sell blood. It would be haram. Why? Because there was no benefit to it. There was no value to it religiously. Because blood is najis. What are you going to use it for? In the past, you can't drink it. It's haram. It's najis, right? There was no normal usage for it. And that's why you find scholars issued the fatwa that buying and selling blood was haram. Let's say a person somehow drew his blood and put it in uh, a jar, a bottle, a one liter bottle, and wanted to sell it. Hundreds of years ago, scholars would say, no, it's haram. You can't sell it. Why? Because it doesn't have an actual value. Why? Because there's no halal benefit to it. How is this going to be used? Today, there is usage for blood. You can donate blood and save someone's life. You can donate blood and have it used for research purposes. There are many halal usages. So today, today, Islamically, you can sell your blood. I know governments have you know, different restrictions, right? Some governments may not allow that. You can only donate, but not sell it. But Islamically, you can Because it has a halal usage, blood can be used and others can benefit from it. Therefore, it's halal because it has market value. It has a halal usage to it. 
So by default, cryptocurrency has value in the eyes of the people. I know some people or maybe some scholars will say, but it's nothing. It's just money in the air. Like there, It's not backed by anything. There's no actual currency. It's just digitally mined. But because it has market value, then it becomes halal to deal with it by default. We're talking now about the Islamic default ruling over here. It has value in the eyes of the people. It has market value, so you can buy and sell it. Number two, it's not gambling because you're actually buying digital money. With gambling, you're not buying anything. You're just betting. You're playing a game and it's a gamble. You're gambling. You're betting an amount of money. You win, you get a million dollars. You lose, you lose a million dollars, right? Or with the lottery, many types of lottery, which many scholars have considered haram. With cryptocurrency, you're actually buying that currency. It's just like the stock market. Therefore, it's not gambling. Yes, it's very volatile. It can be compared to, to gambling because of the dangerous consequences. But technically, for Islamic pur purposes, it is not gambling, my dear brothers and sisters. I know some people ask me, well, say it, cryptocurrency is gambling. No, it's not gambling. You're actually buying 10 Bitcoins, Dodge coins, whatever it is. You're actually buying them. You, you, you own them. You legally own them. That's not considered gambling, which Islam has prohibited. Yes, it may behave like gambling, as we shall see, but it's not technically gambling. Therefore, from that aspect, it's not haram. Number three, these scholars who have said it's permissible, they're like, look, financial crimes could be committed through any currency, right? So this is not a reason for us to declare it haram. If cryptocurrency can be misused by bad apples, by evil people, well, the, all types of currency, the stock market, all types of businesses can be misused as, misused as well. So that's not really a convincing argument for them. So these are the three main fatwas. Now let's move to the next very important part of our discussion. What are some concerns with cryptocurrency? Okay, let's assume it's halal, it's permissible by default Islamic law. Does that mean let's go and invest unconditionally? There are some concerns with cryptocurrency. The main concern that I would like to share with you is the concern of addiction. Cryptocurrency addiction has been categorized by addiction experts as a type of day trading addiction or gambling addiction. Clinically, they refer to this as gambling disorder. So it is a type of addiction, not for everyone, but for some people, they develop an addiction. Now, why is it so addictive? Number one, there are huge swings when it comes to cryptocurrency. See, all currencies go, fluctuate, go up and down, but not like cryptocurrency. I mean, it's crazy how they fluctuate. Suddenly goes up or down. You can make a huge profit in a very short amount of time. That, that's very addicting. Number two, when that happens, when you make so much money in such a short amount of time, you put $100, suddenly within a few days, it becomes $5,000, right? When that happens, a massive influx of dopamine is released in the brain. You get a sense of extreme pleasure. That's recipe for addiction for a lot of people. Number three, like drugs, you want more of that rush, right? You get addicted to that feeling. Number four, but sometimes that digital currency that you've invested in crashes. You feel the pain like drug addicts feel the pain of withdrawal. And your goal becomes to chase the next high. That becomes your obsession. Let me chase the next high. Another concern associated with um, cryptocurrency is that many cryptocurrency investors discuss FOMO. FOMO means the fear of missing out in price rallies, right? That's why you have the desire to continuously check the price and monitor it because you don't want to be missing out. And 
By the way, this fear of missing out is not unique to cryptocurrency. You know, it affects many aspects of our lives, such as social media. One reason why social media, if misused or not used wisely, can be damaging, destructive to your mental health, psychological health, is because of the fear of missing out. It leads to depression. It leads to obsession and addictions. Many people are constantly on their social media because they don't want to miss out. What's going on? What are my friends saying? What are they commenting? They're putting selfies. Let me put my selfies. Let me go with the flow. This constant fear of missing out is what hooks many people to social media in an unhealthy way. The same happens with cryptocurrency. Now, what are some signs of being addicted when it comes to digital currency, when it comes to cryptocurrency? So the first sign is that you find yourself taking an increased risk without much strategy. You don't really have a strategy. You're just taking risk after risk after risk. And you just want that excitement. I made $5,000. That's a sign of addiction. Number two, you become obsessed with researching these cryptocurrencies, trading with them. You have this uh, urge to constantly check prices. I know one brother who would literally check, uh, you know, the app that he was using, Robinhood or some other app, like 300 times a day. <laughs> Once I, I saw him, I told him, brother, Habib, it looks like you're in love. You're checking your messages so frequently. What's going on? Tell us. <laughs> I was trying to tease him. He told me yesterday, I'm deeply in love. I told him, really? Tell me how that happened. He's like, I'm in love with Dogecoin. <laughs> and he had that obsession. See, when you feel that it's getting to that point, I'm really checking it every few minutes. I can't get my eyes off that you know, um, price. I wake up in the morning, it's the first thing on the mind. I'm going to work, it's on my mind. I'm going to school, it's on my mind. Before I sleep, in my gatherings, I'm eating. On the dinner table, it's on my mind. Then you know, look, it's unhealthy. It has become an addiction. Work should never preoccupy you like that. Work should never control you like that. Money should never control you like that. Number three, the third sign of addiction is that you lose interest in social and leisure activities that once you found pleasurable, and you enjoyed them, now you don't really care anymore. All you care is sit in front of that screen and check the prices and buy and sell and make some money. Number four, <coughs> the fourth sign of addiction, signs of addiction when it comes to cryptocurrency, is that you, you feel that you're stressed out. It's causing you anxiety. It's affecting your mood. You become irritable. You can't sleep well. You get enraged. You have anger issues. If you find that Robinhood or that, you know, uh, trading in, with Bitcoin and other types of cryptocurrency is having that effect on you, then you need to draw a line. Know that this is not healthy for you. Number five, another sign of addiction, unhealthy addiction, is that you find yourself hiding you know, the fact that you're dealing with cryptocurrency from your loved ones, from your family members, because you know that if they find out about your obsession, they're going to either give you advice, they're going to caution you, you know, you're not going to hear some good words from them. So you try to hide that from them. That's an indication. Look, maybe you're up to no good. This is not healthy for you. So what are, what are some good points of advice that we can all benefit from? when it comes to such types of investments. Number one, my dear brothers and sisters, don't invest in something that you really don't understand. These days you see teenagers, they're 16 years old. He heard something on the news. He heard something, um, I don't know, at school. He quickly comes, downloads an app, and then she starts investing left and right. You know, And then uh, a, a month later, two months later, he just, uh, evaporates his life savings. He just destroys it completely. Look, if you don't really understand it, you haven't researched well, don't just go and invest in something without knowing it. At least be familiar with it. Know its dangers, know its pros, know its cons. That's number one. Number two, my dear brothers and sisters, never trade or invest, you know, 
um, with money that you can't afford to lose. It's essential money or money that isn't yours. I know some people, they take a loan. They borrow money to buy some Bitcoins. That's not smart. What if you lost that money? Now you're in debt. Why'd you put yourself in that situation? Are you really that desperate? Or money that you really can't afford to lose. Some people are the, all their life savings. They put it in, in these types of markets and these types of investments. That's absolutely not smart to do. Number three, set a trading schedule so that you only trade during certain hours or on certain days. Don't let yourself get obsessed checking the prices and buying and selling day and night. Put a limit for yourself. Okay, every day, I'll set a few minutes aside after work, before work, after school, once I'm done with my important activities, once I've seen my parents, my family, my siblings, I've had quality time, okay, then I'll check it. Give priority to other experiences in your life. Those other experiences, they will give you a quality life. Don't be obsessed. So put some sort of schedule for yourself and take breaks. Some people, they spend hours and hours looking at that screen and monitoring it and doing their calculations. Look, that's not really healthy. My dear brothers and sisters, the Holy Quran has warned us in Surah Al-Munafiqun verse 9 that money, wealth is a distraction. As we approach the end of the month of Ramadan, let's leave with this lesson. Don't let anything distract you from Allah, from that which is right, from preparing for the Akhirah, from quality family time, from knowledge, from education. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in verse 9 of Surah Al-Munafiqun, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu. O you people who believe, what is a quality of a believer? La tulhikum amwalukum wa la awladukum an dhikrillah. Don't let your money, your wealth, and the Quran mentions wealth, before awladukum, before your children. Don't let your money, your wealth, and don't let your children distract you from Allah. وَمَنْ يَفْعَلْ ذَلِكَ Those who do that, they allow their business, their money, their cryptocurrency, their digital currency to distract them. These people have lost. That's it. They failed. Let's keep that in mind. Let's not make our money a source of distraction. I know this digital currency is distracting many minds, especially the youth. And you know one problem that we are seeing in our communities today? You see a teenager, an 18, 20 year old young man or woman, and, and, and you get this uh, you know, attitude from them. There is this attitude amongst them that you know what? Why do I need to work hard, go and study all these years in college and get a degree and then get a job and then you know, only make $80,000 a year? when I can put my money in Dogecoin, in Bitcoin, and the 5,000 will become 100,000 easily, and the 100,000 will become a million, two million, easy money. Why should I work hard? That's a dangerous attitude. My dear brothers and sisters, we need to work hard. Working hard brings barakah in your life. It disciplines you. It gives you quality life. If you're just sitting behind the screen, punching buttons and making millions, okay? May Allah increase your wealth, no problem. But do you think you'll have quality of life? Believe me, people like that suffer eventually from psychological disorders. Their mental health will suffer. Allah loves the hand that works. Allah loves the person who works hard. Wake up early, go to work, do something productive. My advice to the youth, I'm not telling you don't invest in, in, in cryptocurrency. It's fine. You can invest in it. Don't, don't make it a full-time job. Yeah, something you do on the side occasionally, fine, no problem. You have a job, you have a career, you have a plan ahead of you, you have a life ahead of you. And then on the side, you'd like to do, you know, some investments here and there. That's okay, no problem. I'm not criticizing that or putting that down or telling you that's haram. But if you want to make it a full job and say to yourself, you know what, forget college. Forget education. That's it. I know how this thing works. Let me sit in my room and um, day and night, let me just check this. 
or let me vacation all my life and from wherever I am, I can just do this. I don't need an office. I don't need to work. I don't need any boss to work for. Look, that's a superficial lifestyle that you'll be living. There is not, baraka, not much baraka in your life if that's how it is. So don't make it a full-time job. Yes, long-term investments. You want to buy some digital currency now and then keep it. And then later in the future, you know, sell it and make some profit. Okay. But if it's going to be an obsession, an addiction, forget it. Believe me, it's not worth it. And remember, just like you make gains, you could lose them. That's the bait. That's the bait, subhanAllah. That's the greed that we have. You make $10,000 now. You think you're going to make money every single time? No, it's not going to happen. Just like you made money, one day you might lose that money. And then you don't have anything. If you put all your savings and you didn't pursue education, okay, what do you have right now? You start from scratch. You start from zero. I know people who lost all their life savings because of such mistakes, because of hastiness. So my dear brothers and sisters, I would like to remind you how important it is for us to work hard. You know, our hadiths praise the hand of the farmer. Today, if you think of successful people, who comes to your mind? The guy on Wall Street, right? The brokers who charge all that money from transactions. And they're not really giving you something uh, of quality, right? Many of those transactions on Wall Street, what are they really giving to society? They're either charging interest or brokerage fees. They're not really giving you something productive. But no, in our standards of society, they're very successful. They're rich. They live in Manhattan. They work in Manhattan. In the eyes of Allah, that's not a sign of success. A farmer who's humble, who appreciates the ni'mah of God, is more successful than some guy in some billionaire in, on Wall Street who's not really... Uh, uh, you know, helping society, who's just making the rich richer and the poor poorer, poorer, and increasing the inequality gap, and not appreciative of the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not content with what they have. Our hadiths praise the hand of a farmer, the food that you eat. Who prepared that? Who spent and spent endless hours tilling the earth? Right? And working so hard so these crops grow. We don't even think of these people or other people who work hard. I'm not just talking about, you know, the farmers. I'm just bringing them as an example. The hadith states Allah loves the hands that work hard, halal work, bring food to the table, bring halal income to their families. These people are like the people who struggle in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have many hadiths praising them. Remember, that you want a life full of barakah. Money, especially easy money like that, doesn't necessarily bring, bring barakah. And the best proof is look at the life of singers and musicians. They're millionaires. They have all the money that you can ask for. They have the, all the fame and reputation anybody can ask for. But musicians and singers, if you look at their rates of depression, anxiety, and suicide, they're amongst the highest of any category in society. One study in the UK revealed that over 70% of British musicians and singers suffer from depression, whereas the average British population, it's at 19%. But with the musicians, over 70%. See, they've got the money. But is there barakah in it? And subhanAllah, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam in one beautiful hadith states, وَكَثْرَةُ الْإِسْتِمَاعِ إِلَى الْغِنَاءِ يُرِثُ الْفَقْرِ Prolonged exposure, listening to singing, you know, if you're in the singing, music industry, that leads to poverty. The Imam is not talking about financial poverty. He's talking about quality of life. You have millions, but you're poor spiritually, psychologically, emotionally, mentally. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, to conclude this discussion, you will find many scholars saying it's okay, it's halal, no problem. Be responsible. Don't let it become an addiction. Don't make it your full-time job. If you really want to invest in it, 
do so on the side and ask Allah for barakah. Allah only can give you the barakah in your life. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.